Okay. Good morning, and welcome to panel 4162, Reinventing the Newspaper. My name is Mitchell Byers. I'm a reporter with the Daily Camera, the local paper here. Um, before we get started, um, because this is one of the panels where we're going to be doing uh, text in questions, uh, let me run you through that a little bit. If you text, oh, someone uh -oh. didn't listen to me. Uh -oh. <laughs> So on your now silenced cell phones, you are going to text the number 22333, that's two twos and three threes. You're going to text UMCGMB. And once you text in that, it'll give you a response. And once you do that, you are logged into the system. And you'll be able to text us questions. And that's what I'm looking at here on this computer. I'm not watching cat videos, I promise. <laughs> so. If you uh, could write down uh, your question, and there is a 160 character limit, uh, so do keep that in mind. If you are a student, please note that in your text because uh, you will get priority as far as questions go. And uh, when you are done with the session, make sure you text leave uh, to log out. Uh, it will enable you to ask questions at other panels. And uh, let's see, I think with that we can get started. So, uh, introducing our panel, let's start from your right, uh, Joe Sexton, who is the uh, editor at ProPublica and also spent 25 years at the New York Times. We have Doug Carlston, who is the founder of Brotherbund Software and is currently the CEO at Tawa Systems. And then Ellen Sweets, who is uh, has worked at a variety of papers, including the Denver Post uh, here in Colorado, where she won a James Beard Award. And next to me, uh, Bonnie Burton, who has written a lot of books about, um, you may have heard of this, Star Wars. Uh, but she said you'll have to hold the Rogue One questions until after. I've written for newspapers, too. And Well, that's what I was going to get to. Just so you know, you're like, was, why is she on this panel? So my first job was the Daily Boulder camera. So uh, I didn't actually, and I graduated from this school with a with a journalism degree, so I actually have a journalism degree. Those still exist, and people are using them still. I'm looking at all the kids; they're still existing. <laughs> in a and time really not cool long ago, in a galaxy not far away. Okay. Yeah, the cool people read yeah. newspapers. Yeah. We're gonna be super biased on this panel. I hope you're aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's get things started. Uh, if we want to start on the very far end, um, Joe. Uh, sure. Um, so when that, the uh, I, when I, I'm staying with Stephanie and and Alan Rudy and Stephanie's played a huge role in in organizing these uh, panels. So when uh, she told me she was putting together one uh, maybe on newspapers, I said, "Okay, I got a good title for you." Oh, AV guy, I think all the mics are super low. Is there a way to turn them up? Because I yeah, sorry. <laughs> Not everybody. Not as everyone. Loud as Bonnie and <laughs> Am I? Me? <laughs> I'm yelling into the mic, so. All right, cool. Is that better? I I think I can. Is this better? All right. I was about to perform a sexual act if I got any closer. Right. You just confused all the kids in the back. I know. Well. I'll bet he didn't. Yeah. Well, I thought it actually was by design. I, I think this is my eighth panel or whatever, and I, I th thought it was a consensus. We have heard quite enough from this fucking guy. Um, <laughs> anyway, when uh, Stephanie was putting, told me she was putting together a panel on newspapers, I, I suggested a, a title for the panel, which was The Death of Newspapers, A Justifiable Homicide. Um, <laughs> So uh, what am I really talking about? I don't really wish the death of newspapers. Um, but their near-death experience, uh, which we're still in the midst of, is, is deserved uh, in many ways. Um, and if I were to float a kind of uh, provocative notion about why, one of the contributing you know, problems that has led them to the uh, ICU um, is that there came a point at which they actually took themselves a little too seriously. Um, and, you know, if you want to entertain that notion and play along with me or whatever, um, you know, what, what do I really mean? Um, and I think in trying to answer that, we can begin to uh, wrestle with the question of, you know, what do we want newspapers to be? Um, and what did we ever expect that they could be? Um, 
you know, uh, I, I didn't get into newspapers 35 years ago um, because I wanted to save democracy um, or that I, you know, was a warrior for truth and justice. Um, you know, I got into it because back in the day they used to call the newspaper business a racket. Um, and there was something really charming and attractive about the newspaper racket. Um, it was a place because that was, or a newspaper was a thing that was audacious and uh, mostly absurd, uh, a daily exercise in guts and fact-finding and entertainment and outrage and comedy and exposés and recipes uh, and comics and ball scores. Um, you know, it wasn't some pillar of society, and maybe it helped serve a function of that, but uh, it wasn't what attracted me. Um, I, I, I've taken to calling newspapers like an elaborate daily bluff, right? The New York Times publishes a hundred thousand words a day, roughly, just in the print paper, right? So that's a good-sized novel, um, and the idea that you could write a novel every day and have it be the, quote, paper of record. I mean, it's a kind of bizarre, unsustainable claim. I mean, I like its outsized uh, ambition and its kind of uh, uh, provocative arrogance, but you can't really believe it to be, you know, the gospel. Um, it was a human enterprise and thus both wildly uh, impressive and deeply flawed. Um, the, uh, anyway, I had a lot of company who I think for many years shared uh, my appetites and my excitements. Um, but more often than not, when I heard them sort of evangelize the, the virtues of of uh, newspapers and both why they had gotten into it and why they needed to to exist. Um, I heard much more of the sort of moral argument uh, than a kind of basic business sell. Um, and, you know, saluting Watergate, uh, um, making a movie like Spotlight uh, can, you know, in many ways win people's hearts and you know, winning people's hearts is is an important part of making a buck as well. Um, but, you know, they can also, you know, long term, can those arguments get people to consistently, reliably open their pockets or their wallets, uh, attract invest in, in investors, um, you know. Uh, and this sort of placement of absolute uh, virtue, this religious exercise that newspapers were involved in that were, you know, uh, so essential to uh, society helped lead to a kind of equally absurd arrangement of their business operations, which was that, and they took great pride in it, you know, there's a divide between, you know, the, the reporters and the editors and the newsroom and the dreaded business side, you know, and the two couldn't talk um, because, God, the business side might infect the monastery itself uh, where, you know, the monks were creating their, their scriptures. Um, I mean, what other business can you imagine in which the creators of the product were barred by policy from talking with the people charged with selling that product. I mean, I don't know. Uh, again, it could sound righteous, um, but it also seemed to me equally reckless. Uh, and so the great cataclysm uh, that's begun and only probably begun to shake the newspaper industry um, is, I think, fundamentally a healthy thing. Um, and 
you know, I it has exacted um, some real human costs. Um, I've lost any number of colleagues uh, to uh, the cataclysm. Um, newspapers have closed uh, as a consequence of it. Um, but you know, when I bumped into Bonnie at the in the room before, she said, "You know, I'm going to be positive," and I said, "Damn right," and I am too. Um, the uh, what this cataclysm is um, making necessary is a real reckoning with what we want newspapers to be, um, and uh, you know what we think is is worth saving about them. Um, if anything, and that that should be an open question, you know. So I spent 25 years at the Times. I began there as a sports writer. Um, the uh, you know I, I became a city reporter. I became a sports editor. I became a city editor. I became a boss, which is really a hard to imagine thing. Um, the uh, and you know you can live in this what I have taken to calling the New York Times biosphere. Um, it's a self-sustaining world of wonders in many ways. Uh, you're the sports editor and you want to create some uh, cool interactive graphic or online storytelling uh, about a fatal avalanche out in Washington State. The amount of resources you can bring to bear on that are extraordinary. You know, guys in the data department and, and in the design department and in the photography department and in the video department. And you can create a really pretty awesome and magisterial thing. Um, and so, and then you begin to persuade yourself that, you know, I, I, I actually can't live outside this biosphere. It's a, this is the only place that's safe, you know, um, and uh, because it's the only place that'll last. Uh, and, you know, I was 53 and had uh, two-year-old twins. Um, that's a whole other sex act I won't get into, um, how I had twins at 51. Um, but, you know, I, I'm going to be working for a long time. Uh, I'll be working until I'm fucking 85. Um, and I decided to step out of the New York Times in part because I believe that the future is bright whether it's for that newspaper or some newly invented thing uh, that is to come. And I took up with an organization called ProPublica, um, which was started about eight years ago by the former managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. And the conceit was, okay, investigative reporting is drying up around the country. Newspapers are either folding in their entirety or cutting back on the kind of costly, long-term investigative work that is sort of the heart of the movie spotlight. Um, and the idea was, well, if we were going to create another financial model for how that might sustain itself, uh, could you do it through philanthropy? Um, and they're now eight years in. They've won a couple of Pulitzer Prizes for whatever that's worth, but it's worth something. Um, their uh, entire staff now is 62, where once upon a time was maybe 10. Um, you know, uh, and the model has worked. They've diversified their fundraising. People give by, you know, in the kind of Bernie Sanders way of clicking on the donate button on the website and giving their $27. Uh, on average, and you know there are billionaires in the world who actually care deeply about um, investigative journalism um, who have invested large sums of money in it as well and it may or may not in the long term be a sustainable financial model, but what I love about it is its kind of explicit um, rationale, unlike the newspapers I inhabited for most of my career, they were quite clear. We're not going to make a buck here. We're asking for your bucks to sustain this. Um, and that may or may not be persuasive, but it's clear. Um, that said, I do think there's a buck to be made in the newspaper business, in the journalism business. Um, and I have every uh, confidence that that will happen. Thanks for having me.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I think one of the things we have to understand to reinvent the newspaper is what actually happened. Uh, the news, the news, the press, the fourth estate used to be um, uh, considered absolutely essential to a functioning democracy. It was the way you got information out. Uh, it was the way that people were well enough informed to make wise decisions about their leadership and other issues. Um, Superman had a newspaper job as a, as a day job. There were all kinds of uh, virtues associated with the press. Uh, the real question now is how much of that still exists? How much, how much are we losing as newspapers shrink and, and close? Uh, I was on the board of, of Bilo Corporation for about five years in the last decade. And uh, it started, when I went there, I think it was a $1.5 billion a year business, and it lost regularly 20% of its revenue per year while I was on the board, not entirely my doing. Um, the, I think that the, uh, the internal belief was, you know, since World War II, most revenues for newspapers came from advertising. Before that, it was largely subscriptions, but it moved heavily toward advertising as they took advantage of a local monopoly for classified and display ads and most newspapers became monopolies or near monopolies in their area. The management at Below felt that it was techies like me, um, including especially people like Craig Newmark who started Craigslist and, and mostly gave away what they were trying to sell people for a lot that were destroying the newspaper industry. However, readership was going down 20%. They weren't going down 20% because our ads weren't selling. They're going down 20% because people were finding other ways of getting the kind of short form information that most people wanted on a daily basis. AP was available online. It was available through all kinds of, of sources. And increasingly, I think people noticed that for news, um, uh, national and international news, pretty much what everybody was offering was the AP um, uh, headlines. So that you weren't getting heavy differentiation. Where newspapers still were incredibly valuable was um, local sports, investigative journalism, and, and some other areas that weren't well uh, served by, uh, uh, by the uh, online services that were available at the food. time. Food. Food was one of them. Food's very important. There are also some really good cookbooks out there. There are some alternate ways of getting there, but you're right. Um, and of course, I'm probably blind to that one. The, so what happened was uh, that where people found um, alternatives, they were starting to take them. They were starting to prefer them for one reason or another. Uh, one of the ways of, of providing a needed service is through voluntary contributions from members or supporters, like ProPublica is doing with investigative journalism, the Center of Inve Investigative Journalism. There are other ones that are doing it. I was. Uh, chairman for five years of uh, Public Radio International. And Public Radio tried to fill a void of what was, uh, I think, considered at least in terms of radio, long form journalism, longer form anyhow than headlines, and did it through a membership and a, a donative uh, process. And that is still largely healthy. This is contrary to uh, some popular belief. It's not largely funded by the national government. There's a very small amount of contribution to the, to the uh, uh, public media. It's mostly uh, membership driven by people in local communities, and it seems to work. I'm hoping that ProPublica works because investigative journalism is really important. But there's still, there's still a gap there, and the real question is, is this an evolutionary process going to lead us to getting uh, the kind of information we need through new media, which is what people increasingly are turning to, um, or is, is paper itself somehow still necessary to the process. And I would argue that I, th that I think we're going to get what we need, what we want and value in terms of news, but probably not in a, in a, a paper printed form. Uh, you can look at things that were largely left behind in the first wave, uh, local, new, uh, local sports, for example. And there are all kinds of online services that are starting to cover this effectively. Uh, some of them are organized, some of them are disorganized. I know people who tweet their kids' games online live so that when other parents can't be there at the games, they follow them that way. I think it's a little painful, but you can do it if you want to. There, there, are, 
there are, are part of the problem, of course, is the budgets shrank. Is that people lost their uh, they lost their bureaus, they lost their stringers, they lost essentially their access to information. So newspapers did start to rely increasingly on the one surviving bureau. And there's Reuters Business, and there are a few others, but largely largely AP. And um, so the quality of the information was also going down in the printed uh, uh, in the printed newspapers. But you are starting to see an uptick in alternate sources um, across the media. And the real question is, can online come up with a model that will give us the same level of vibrancy that we had when printed newspapers were effective? And the short answer is probably not if, in fact, you need to put the same number of dollars in. Because the number of dollars available to newspapers was due to the fact they had a local advertising monopoly, which is incredibly lucrative. And until, in fact, the press rather than the retail universe learns how to take advantage of online advertising in an effective way and gets over this very uh, this problem of the trying to build a Chinese wall between information gathering and money gathering, um, they're going to have a very hard time with this. This came up in public, uh, public radio because although sponsorship was permitted, um, ads were not in public radio. I don't know if you've noticed that sponsors increasingly sound an awful lot like ads. Uh, that's it. I think it's an, an inevitable process. If, if uh, that's where you get your money, that's basically what people do so they can keep the doors open. So I don't have a whole lot more to, to lend to this except to say I, I am optimistic that we're going to get what we need. I don't think it's going to be a, as rich and as deep um, if we, we try to sustain the model uh, that's expert driven, of professionals supplying the information we need for a long term. I think the way we're going to get there in terms of quality is probably going to be through crowdsourcing information. Crowdsourcing is a process of asking a lot of people and uh, uh, to both bring you information and to filter the information so that it increases in accuracy. Uh, Wikipedia is a common encyclopedia of information online. I imagine all of you have used it. If you've ever wondered how accurate it is, look up things that you know something about and see how many errors you run into. I usually find a few, but it's generally pretty good. Um, and I think it's getting better over time. So my, my optimistic approach is I think we're all going to become the reporters of the future. Some of us are going to be much better at it than others. And my hope is that we'll develop reputation systems for people who are good at accurately reporting what they see that will allow their voices to be weighted more heavily so we tend to get a more accurate picture of the universe. It's a long-term approach. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. But I do think that's the future of the newspaper. Thank you. So, oh, real quick before we move on, I see a lot of you writing. If you don't want to text in questions or you want to save your texts for emojis with your friends, raise a hand and um, we'll have a producer get you an index card. Um, and that way they can give that to me um, if you don't want to text in your question. Uh, so if the producers or the people with index cards could kind of raise your hands. Um, they're in the back of the room. Yeah, just kind of uh, try and get their attention if you have a question you'd like to write down. Right. Okay. Go ahead. So here's the deal. <laughs> you grown-ups, forgive me. I'm just going to talk to the kids, okay? <laughs> they bothered to get up this morning, get dressed, and sit here and look as though they really want to be here. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you guys. Uh, and I'm going to answer a couple of questions that you're probably going to want to ask me anyway. So I will tell you that I started out in journalism at my father's uh, weekly newspaper. It was a black uh, weekly that was started during the Depression. And fast forward, I grew up doing that. My mother was an editor. Uh, I had lots of books in my room. I used to get in trouble a lot. And so they would send me to my room where I had a wall full of books. And I read, and I read, and I read, because I got into trouble a lot. <laughs> I know that reading formed the foundation for my love of journalism. And because I started out working for my dad's newspaper, I went to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch because I was the first black woman that they hired as a reporter at the Post. And the reason they hired me was because I did a lot of stories about the black community that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch was overlooking. 
And our job was to prove to people who lived in the greater metropolitan area that not all blacks were criminals, athletes, or entertainers, that we did other stuff. And what I used to do is go out and find stories that nobody else was looking for. And one of the reasons I think newspapers are in trouble today is because they've become so goddamn boring that people don't want to read them. Rolling Stone has ads. Rolling Stone has sometimes a hundred pages. And it's because they're giving people information that they can't get anywhere else. The Times kind of does that still. But I worked for the Dallas Morning News, which was owned by the A.H. Below Company, and I felt, now you're going to get the other side of this story, okay? <laughs> Those of us in the newsroom felt that the paper started to decline when focus groups came in. Whatever happened to the old-fashioned way of a paper saying, this is what we're going to write about, and the business people need to stay out of the newsroom. When business people started making decisions about news content, we started having problems. And when I was a food writer, the first, the first and only time, and this is after I left the Post-Dispatch and went to the Dallas Morning News, the only time I ever really had a problem with my editor was when she gave me an assignment that was so unbelievably stupid I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and I said, Kathy, this assignment is so unbelievably stupid, I can't believe you're giving it to me. <laughs> and she said, but you have to do it. And I said, but I'm not going to. This is embarrassing. I don't want my name on this. And she said, well, you don't have to have your name put on it. <laughs> you laugh. But there should never be a time when you write something that you're too embarrassed to have your name on. And that was happening in the newsroom. And bit by bit, focus groups and people who were not in the newsroom and who didn't come up in my, I was about to say my shit disturbing tradition. <laughs> you said it. You said it already. I'm so sorry. Okay, l let me just tell you this. Let me just tell you this. When uh, I first was invited to be part of CWA, and uh, they sent us the finished uh, uh, program online, I forwarded it to my daughter who lives in New York. And she called me up. We talk every Sunday. And she called me up and she said, Mom, please, just try and mind your mouth. <laughs> and I said, OK, Hannah, I'll do my best. And she said, yeah, but Mom, you know, sometimes your best isn't good enough. So I, I apologize to the teacher. I apologize to you students, although I know I haven't said anything you haven't heard. <laughs> But the, 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 the fact is that newspapers and newspapers are declining for several reasons. And some of the reasons are because the 24-hour news cycle and media matters and alternative uh, venues for extracting information have come along. But there is nothing like getting up in the morning and having a newspaper in your hand and reading what has happened overnight and reading it in detail in a way that you can't on a tablet, on your phone, or um, you know, on, on, on your desktop. And certainly, have, have you all seen the, the ad, the commercial for the guy who, it, it's, a, it's not an American commercial, it, it's a, maybe German or Dutch or something. Anyway, the guy is saying, to his wife, who is sitting down writing her grocery list, and he's pointing out to her that she can do this electronically. She didn't need to. She doesn't need to do this by, you know, writing a paper and pen. And then he he sees one of the kids, and the kids writing something, and he's saying, "No, no, no! You use uh, you use your laptop." And Finally, he's sitting in the bathroom, and he's enthroned, and he calls to his wife and says. I need toilet paper. And she slides the iPad under the door <laughs> with a picture of toilet paper on it. So, <laughs> so you know, this is, this is, it takes imagination. It takes energy. You, it, it takes a, a belief 
that you can make a difference. And I started out in this business, I'm probably, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably old, the oldest person on this panel. I'm 75. I started out uh, in, in my mid to, mid to late 20s. And at the time, the Post-Dispatch was owned by the Pulitzer paper. And the Pulitzer had a very honorable uh, reputation for yellow journalism. Now, it morphed into something a little bit nicer. But we didn't fear anything. And we always knew that if we wrote something that uh, advertisers didn't like or that a certain segment of the business community didn't like, we didn't care. One year. The Post-Dispatch did an incredible series on uh, shenanigans among used car dealers and how they turned back odometers and how they, you know, screwed people who wanted to buy used cars. And our car dealership revenue shrank to almost nothing. And it went to the Globe Democrat, which was the more conservative paper at the time in the community. And after a while, they realized that it was a bad idea because they weren't getting the sales from the Globe Democrat that they had got from the Post-Dispatch. So it was a little dip, but it came back. And we found, again, for example, on Wednesdays, there is a reason even shrinking newspapers have a food section. People might never cook those recipes, but they love to read about them. They like to read about the stories of the people who made them. They like to read about the restaurants. When I was at the Denver Post, excuse me, <clears throat> when I was at the Denver Post, I did a story on the opening of Frasca, and I did a profile of the guys who opened it. I did a story about Mateo and the guy who opened it. People love reading about themselves. And when you stop writing about the things that affect people's lives, when a committee starts deciding what information you should read, things go fall down and go boom, you know? And so when I'm talking to young people, I say, be fearless. Find ways to write what you believe in Read until there's no tomorrow. And remember what my father in a suites once said to me that I'm passing on to you. Develop a skill for writing and writing well because it's a skill no one will ever be able to take away from you. So whether you're writing for a newspaper, a tabloid, a, uh, a magazine, know that you can do that and transfer it anywhere. But I hope you'll still be reading newspapers. Um, I just, you guys can hear me OK, so I don't have to scream. I just want to do a quick poll, because I like to know my audience, because <laughs> I keep making references that only three people get. And I'm, as I do stand-up com comedy, too, and it's starting to hurt me. So <laughs> uh, how many people here read their news or read content um, from paper? from like a newspaper. Oh yeah, there we go, okay. How many people get their content mostly online? And it could still be a newspaper, but just online. Oh, okay, that's a good amount. How, people, how many people don't even read news articles, they get all their headlines from Twitter? Really? Okay. Well, I'm from San Francisco, so that would be most San Francisco. Okay, um, or from trending topics. Like when you see a hashtag in a celebrity, do you immediately think they're dead, or do you know that that might not be dead? Okay. Okay, no one got that joke. Awesome. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier I got my uh, degree here in, in journalism. Um, I graduated in 1995, uh, and, I, <laughs> and I also got an English literature degree because I wanted to do both journalism and fiction, screenwriting and fiction. And, um, but I started writing probably when I was in fifth grade when I was not allowed to join the school paper because I was a girl. So I started my own newspaper and poached all the good writers. And uh, we had, uh, this is gonna be fun talk, okay. So um, I had this thing called a typewriter. It's a keyboard that isn't connected to anything. <laughs> that you put paper in and sometimes your fingers would get stuck in it if it wasn't an electronic 
one, and white out was this eraser that was liquid. That, okay. Um, and my mom was the school. Li- I know it's fun. I love I love doing this because all of you know this. So it's fun to see what they know. So then my mom was the school librarian, so she had access to something called a Xerox machine. And it's this thing. Yeah, I love this. See, they're already shrugging. I love this. And it's something that you copy paper and you can make more paper. So it's like your own little Gutenberg press. Ah, I bet they don't know that. And that's when you publish your newspaper. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm shaming the youth. So um, this is all on Wikipedia. You can look this up later. Um, anyway, so I made my own school newspaper and that's when I decided I was like the female Will Hurst of the 70s. And Will Hurst, look him up, that's a good one. Susan Cain um, is a movie. Um, so anyway. Uh, I decided to do that, and then I found out there's this thing called letters to the editor of every newspaper, and I started typing up angry letters to the editor when I was in junior high about uh, articles that I disagreed with because the reporters weren't getting youth culture. Uh, And I thought I was being awesome by writing these letters to the editor. So if you don't know what a letter to the editor is, that's the comment section. (laughs) Right? Of anything, but it's you send it in an envelope and, okay. So I started to get letters to the editors published. I wouldn't tell my parents, and my dad and my mom both read the newspaper at the morning breakfast table. So they would look through the newspaper and then see like a really angry letter about some article, usually about Madonna and the reporters not understanding like where she's coming from or something, because there's always some scandal. And they'd see it and be like, "Did you did you read a letter to the editor?" And then I get to school and my civics teacher. That was a gov- I don't know what they call them now, but they were kind of like your teacher, world affairs or news teacher or something that you have in elementary school and junior high that tells you to read the newspaper so you're aware of local news and world news so then you can discuss it as a class. And then they'd see the letter to the editor and get excited. And I felt kind of like, oh, well then you mean you could do this as a living? Because that's what reporting kind of was, but you actually had to get sources and quotes. You couldn't just go on a rant, though. That's what editorials are, and I love that idea even more. So I started writing at a pretty young age, and I, we haven't talked anything about writer vanity, so I'm just going to slip that in there. A byline is amazing. When you see that you have something in print with your name under it and or online, there's nothing like that sense of satisfaction that you've done something, you've completed something, you've communicated with your peers or maybe someone that you wanted to reach. It's all great until you get to the comments section, and then you... Val- your, your life is in question. But for those of you who don't know what a comment section is, it's after every article online, most online sites, most newspapers, most magazines, most websites lets readers commentate on what you wrote. Sometimes, if you're lucky, they read the article before they start posting. <laughs> most of the time what happens is they see a headline or a word in the headline and then go straight to comments and say you're a horrible writer. So. I I have this rule where I don't read comments, um, and that includes YouTube. So never read the comments. If you post something on YouTube, you're just going to question your life forever. So I started doing that as a pretty young age. And then in high school, I wrote for the high school paper. And then in college, I wrote for the Campus Press, which was the name of the campus newspaper here. They changed it to something else because controversy, of course, makes everybody change their name. Um, But I wrote everything. did everything I could to write stories that I thought college kids like myself would be interested in. And that's, as a writer, what you need to do um, is write things that you think aren't being covered the way you think they're being covered, and also interview people, talk to people that were there. Um, The problem with journalism, and I've worked at papers, I mostly do, right now I mostly write for online tech sites that are daily tech and daily entertainment. So. I write for CNET.com, which covers tech, science, entertainment, and uh, everything to do with you know, politics and encryption and all that. But I also write for Playboy. So I, like, I do a lot of entertainment reporting. Um, you can read Playboy now. There's no naked pictures anymore. So you guys are OK to do that. Um, ask your parents first. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble. OK. Um, so I've done that. Um, but what I've noticed the most problems what we're having with online journalism, which didn't really happen when I was working at newspapers and magazines, 
is there's not a lot of emphasis on fact checking anymore. There's not a lot of emphasis on, are we sure that's right? And that's even in entertainment reporting when someone, a fan site, says a rumor is going to happen in a movie and all of a sudden by the end of the day it's it's fact but it's not because no one interviewed a director no one interviewed got a quote from the the movie studio or tv studio and that happens across the board on all kinds of topics and wikipedia was mentioned earlier and it is pretty decent because it is there's re you have to reference facts and at the bottom there's little things called footnotes which are little numbers by these facts, and you click on it, and it shows you the primary source. So it shows you where they got those facts. But it's not all factual, so it's good to look things up in multiple sources. But there's a lot of lazy bloggers and journalists out there who see one little quote, and they'll have a whole story based on one quote that they didn't even see if it was actually said, or one fact, or one tiny little trending topic that they blow into something else that isn't true. So as a reader, it's now up to you to be a little bit more diligent and look at a couple more sources and find, if you're reading entertainment news, know that Variety, Hollywood Reporter, those are you know kind of the entertainment people that to trust whereas you know star wars girl 69 may not have all the facts so you got to be careful of bloggers that are just making stuff up for clickbait click so it's funny because we were talking about how you know advertisers and the business development people and all these people get in the way of reporting because you have to be careful not to upset advertisers that never ends so when you're in an online newspaper online magazine the ads are even more pervasive and sneakier, and some advertising sneaks into keywords. So you might see a link hyperlinked, which means it's like blue on the text, and you can click on it with your cursor. The problem with that is that sometimes instead of going to a definition or another article, it goes to an advertising site or it goes to a pop-up ad. And anyone who's been online knows how annoying banner ads are and ads that take over a screen and you don't know how to get rid of them because that little X to get rid of them is tiny. That's what we had to deal with in print, only they weren't moving. They weren't distracting you from the article other than being off to the side or maybe a full page. This is this is going to distract you and drive you crazy. And that's something we have to deal with. We have to deal with editors that know that the, the online site has to make money, just like any other publication. So they'll sneak in uh, what we call infotainment, or <laughs> I don't even know what we call it anymore, but it's, it's advertising disguised as articles. And that shows up in print magazines every once in a while. Women's magazines are the worst for that. You just have to be diligent as a reader and care about that you want facts, that you want to find your information in the in the best way possible. And it takes a little sleuthing. And we had to do this as, in print. You know, you don't just take one newspaper's opinion. You know that some newspapers and some magazines have a slanted viewership or they have a, you know, a bias. And online sites are the same way. So that's something you still have to know as a writer. But I mean, I don't want to say print is dead, and it's sort of my fault that the campus newspaper went online because in 1995 I put it online. And when I worked at Daily Camera, uh, Boulder Daily Camera, I tried my hardest to get it online, and I remember one of the editors saying, oh, that Internet thing's a fad. That's not going to last long. You're wasting your time. And uh, I went to go work for Apple the next day because I was like, well, I have a feeling that's going to stick around. Um, but I worked in the tech industry for a long time, and... I worked at different companies that basically their ideas that stuck and still stick today are community and news. And they know that's why people go online. Sure, there's entertainment value in games and you know everything that you get out of video and that sort of thing, but people want news quickly. They don't want to be the last to know. No one wants to be the last to know their favorite celebrity died. No one wants to be the last to know that their sports team failed or won. No one wants to be the last to know that we're at war. <laughs> So you go where the news is going to be the quickest, and that's why online is so important to people because they don't want to wait for print. For me, I think the biggest thing that I'm seeing a shift in is there's two types of readers of, of content when it comes to news. There's people that just, they just want snippets. They just want the headline, maybe a video, just the facts, ma'am, who, what, when, where, why. Not even why sometimes, just who, what, when, where. That's it, because that's all they have time for, because there's a lot going on in the world, and that's all they have time for. 
And then there's people that want what we call long form journalism, which is funny because that was journalism. <laughs> and these are articles that are more than a page, more than three paragraphs. They're interviews with people. They're, you know, longer commentary pieces. They're the why. And you need to read those too. You can't just have some of the facts and not know why this is happening, not get a perspective, not have a connection. And luckily, both those forums still exist, but those are the ones competing for eyeballs. And you can do both. You don't have to pick a side, but just know that long form still exists. And we care about, I assume all of us on this table care about long form just as much as getting the facts. And that's where the next generation of writers and reporters need to know that it's not just BuzzFeed, that it's not just like Twitter headlines. You actually have to give con you have to get reason. You have to get the why and the understanding because the human race needs to know why these are happening and how they can do something and how they can help and why it affects them, not just it's happening. So I, I'm very positive for the future of journalism. Print may come and go, and I still think an ebb and flow happens. So when I was in San Francisco in 1995, zines were huge. And that's when online was just starting and really getting its grasp. But zines were these things that were very specific topics, and they were magazines that you just print and Xerox and staple, and they were at every record store and every comic book store, and it was self-published. And that's what kids did. Now a lot of that is online and blog form or you know just fun whatever. But everyone had sort of a writing experience that was their own, and it was like a DIY do-it-yourself kind of spirit. And I think that still exists online. And I still think I still buy books that aren't Kindle, that aren't online. I still buy magazines because I write for them, so I'm probably paying my own salary that way. Um, <laughs> I still think there's a reason for it. Um, I don't think journalism and good writing will ever go away. We need good writers. Nothing hurts more than spending time reading an article for information and knowing that the writer had no training whatsoever with grammar, with just getting to the point, with actually making sense, and it's painful. So to me, the biggest message I can give to writers out there that are starting is just write, 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 read, 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 write, 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 read, read, read. And the more you read good writing, the better writer you'll be, and the more you write different kinds of writing, editorial, news, entertainment, interviews. If you're going to interview people, listen to what they're saying. Don't just spew questions. So you guys have lots of time and luckily you have your readership right here and our readership keeps growing. So, you know, just keep at it and stay positive. You know what, Bonnie, oh, uh, just <laughs> as an adjunct to what Bonnie just said, I, I want to point out to everyone, uh, especially the you young people who might now think about writing letters to the editor under a pseudonym. Um, <laughs> The, years ago, one of my editors said for every letter that they receive in letters to the editor, that one letter represents a hundred people who do not write. So if you think your one letter doesn't matter, you're wrong. Even if it never makes it into print, it matters. And I think that the whole notion of becoming disengaged from the, the dissemination of news is related to the fact that we read, we react, but we don't communicate to the people who present that information that we like it, we don't like it, we hate it, we love it. It's very important. And actually, uh, since you've already kind of moved us in that direction, was there anything um, that any of you wanted to address um, as far as your fellow panelists? Um, oh, just points? real quick, I do want to say for you guys that are just starting out in journalism, a big thing is you don't get paid necessarily per article anymore. You get paid in something called traffic, which is what these people are. That's what we call audience, clicks. And so sometimes you have to write things that a lot, so you have to write a lot of content in order to get your traffic numbers, or you have to pick very strategically articles that no one else is doing and get a perspective no one else is getting, so eyeballs. I mean, that's regular journalism 101 is be different, be interesting, but just know traffic is huge and that is readership. And that is something you, that's never gonna go away. You have to get eyeballs. Just be sure that you have ethics as well when you're doing that. Um. I'd love to jump in just to express a different point of view from Ellen. Um, 
the uh, with as much respect and lack of profanity as possible, just to honor <laughs> honor her daughter's wishes. Uh, the um, you know this notion of focus groups. Uh, the and I you know I, I understand where Ellen is coming from and and the how a newsroom or a newspaper or a news organization puts uh, focus groups to use, whatever, and focus groups, right, by which we understand you take readers of the paper or whatever and uh, ask them some questions about what their experiences have been like and uh, what they've enjoyed and what they've uh, been upset by and what they think is lacking and what they'd want more of. Um, so any good tool uh, can be misused, and it sounds like in Ellen's experience that it was misused if uh, business people were in the newsroom then dis making editorial decisions. Uh, but they can be put to great use, right? Because there's a, a there's a kind of obvious and overdue uh, uh, efficacy to it, right? Because again, if you people are reluctant. Um, to, to conceive of the newspaper uh, as a product um, because the, somehow that seems offensive or beneath what newspapers do. But it, that's what it is. It's a product that's being sold. Um, and if you were making any other products and didn't listen to the people who were selling them telling you, you know what, I, 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 your vacuum cleaner sucks because uh, I can't plug it into whatever, um, you know, you'd be quickly in the toilet as a business. Um, and, you know, just play it out, right? So you're in a focus group with a number of, uh, and the Times did a very good and thoughtful and way, 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 overdue exercise in talking to its readers. And if you found out that, you know, in an intelligently assembled focus group or whatever, no one was reading X, whatever that happened to be, crime coverage in your metropolitan section um, or there was reason to believe in a statistically sound way that in fact no one was reading it, why would you continue to offer it? Um, you know, there are certain imperatives that you would still like to think you were honored to do it, crimes of significance, um, crimes with, you know, greater meaning. Um, crimes that were just great stories because sadly they often are. Um, so, you know, I do think that, that focus groups and their use have a real role um, and the Times is engaged in now, you know, uh, a decade too late or a decade late, we'll see if it's too late, um, in some really sophisticated research into uh, what their audience wants and, and what uh, they might be able to offer that, uh, that would increase their audience. Um, and that's not a heresy and that's not a betrayal um, and nobody says you have to uh, then uh, forfeit your right about what you ultimately put online or in the paper to the business side. Um, so uh, I just wanted to note that and then and, and you know in that kind of, of mindset uh, one of my favorite sayings from a guy who had spent his life at the at the New York Times and whose father had spent his life at the New York Times and we used to have uh, orientation for new hires, new employees at the Times and department heads would get up and speak in front of them and, and I was in front of uh, his group once and he said, the New York Times is a place full of rules that don't exist. <laughs> um, and if you stop for a second and let the full profundity wash over you, which I, I can see is not happening, but um, <laughs> just stop and just stop and think. Right, full of rules that don't exist. People put themselves in shackles that they aren't obligated to put themselves in, and that kind of mindset, when it gets when it comes to the idea of how do you uh, aggressively and actively sell this great product you have, um, I'll tell you a quick story that I think is revealing in that way. <clears throat> so when I was sports editor at the Times, we did a very ambitious um, project called that ultimately came to be called Snowfall. And it's now gained some notoriety as some seminal moment in the world of online storytelling. I, I, don't, I don't know whether I believe that, but it sounds kind of nice to my mom and dad. Um, 
The, uh, but it was a way of telling this story. This is the deadly avalanche out in Washington State, and we were going to do it in a new way online uh, with a, a, a novel sort of integration of photography and video um, and data and interactive graphics, and we were, it was a 17,000-word piece. So talk about long form. It rarely gets longer former than that. Um, and uh, so, it, you know, it was a pretty uh, ballsy thing, and we actually paid attention to how we were going to lay out the text of the story so that it would arrive right at the moment where we wanted that photograph to appear. And, um, and so uh, they created, the people in the tech department created, like, what was the equivalent of a little trailer of, you know, snowfall uh, coming soon or whatever. And uh, it was meant to, you know, to go out uh, to the world, um, you know, uh, sort of immediately before publication. And because I spent my life there trying to be uh, devious as I could, um, I got that little uh, link to the, uh, to the trailer, and I gave it to as many people as I could with as large Twitter followings as possible and said, at a certain time tomorrow, can you tweet this out? Um, and I guess some of that didn't get through to the people that I sent it to. Um, so they started tweeting it out immediately. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden the, they had built a little server to serve this uh, trailer. That fucking thing crashed. I mean, people were coming to the thing. And, you know, and it was authentic excitement. People were like, I've never seen anything this beautiful on the Internet. This is awesome. But I came into work the next day and I almost lost my job. And they were like, what are you doing putting this thing out when the full story isn't ready yet? And, you know, it's going to be a couple of hours before we get New York Times readers demand to have, says fucking who? <laughs> you know, it was like an effective bit of advertising for something you were enormously proud of and that you wanted as many people in the planet to read. And yet somehow people thought this offended some, you know, uh, uh, commandment within the New York Times that thou shall not try to get your story more widely read. It was madness. But it grows out of the same, you know, uh, inbred, uh, that's not the right word, but inculcated, um, uh, you know, thought in the newspaper business, which is, well, we're not really a business, <laughs> you know, we're a societal good. And the more we can break that down, the more rules that don't exist that we can break is where I think newspapers will have a future. Oh. So we're going to move on to the question uh, part of the uh, morning. So once again, I'm going to remind you if you want to text in a question, um, 22333. If you haven't signed in yet, it's UMCGMB. Um, I am seeing a couple of you have actually just texted UMCGMB to me. Um, so if you've done that, that means you're already in and you can go ahead and text your question. Um, so while uh, since we just had a story about Twitter, uh, let's go to a Twitter question. Uh, so because anyone can send a tweet with a photo and a story at any time, are phones negatively affecting journalism? I, I'm just going to chime in right now because I work for CNET and it's tech based and I will say as a reporter, um, one of the best tools you have is this phone because you can take video as it's happening. So if you see something that's happening that's scary, that's creepy, that's weird, that's awesome, this is what's going to supplement your writing. So, and report, editors always say, never leave without your phone because this is your, this is kind of like old school camera, right? Or new school, new school camera, where you don't need the photographer following you around. It used to be as a journalist, you made friends with the photo team instantly because you knew that photo, articles with photos would get more attention, more play in the newspaper and magazine. So you found the best photographer, bribed them a lot, and then convinced them to follow you around when you were on articles because we never had enough photographers to go around for stories. And sometimes that's determined by your editor ahead of time, but when I was working there, it was, 
at any magazine or newspaper, it was you become friends with whoever's going to provide the visual. This is your new best friend. So if you have any kind of skill in editing, that's even better with video editing. But this is what you need. And I mean, a great example of that that happened, was it last week? when I mean, this wasn't even a reporter. This is what happened on Twitter. So you do, as a, a reporter and a journalist, have to pay attention to what's going on on Twitter. But the hijacking that happened with the guy with the bomb on the plane, and you found out later it was a fake bomb, but the people on the plane, both the crew and passengers, were getting selfies with him and posting it after they got off the plane, but they were all smiling. Like, to me, it's like, if you're about to die, I don't think selfie would be the first thing you would do, but um, they didn't know that the bomb that this guy had attached to himself was fake, but, and, and the guy with the bomb's not really smiling, you know, and it's like, he, but he was willing to take the selfie because I think he, you know, this could just help his cause, but uh, that's a moment as a reporter when you're online and when you see something that like that come up, if you can be the first to write something, obviously everyone's going to write something quick. But if you have commentary on that, or if you have like the history of people that are in dangerous situations that take photos, not really caring if they live or die, that's a great article. I would love to write, like, read an article about the history of all the hijackings that have happened over history, you know, over time with airplanes. How many people have had their picture taken with the guy that hijacked it? Like, maybe this has been a trend this whole time, and we didn't know. That's a story, and I know it sounds frivolous, but that's going to get you traffic, that's going to get you attention, that's going to be different than what the other reporters are doing. So to me, to answer your question, I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible, this is a tool, this isn't a hindrance. Think of tech as how can it help me write a better story instead of getting in the way of writing my story, and sometimes it's great, and sometimes... You know, you have to just know what's going on, and if you can't be the first person to write it, because everyone wants a scoop, everyone wants to be the first newspaper to publish the news, if you can't be the first to be the best, so if you can't be the first one to say this is happening, be the one who interviews an expert that says why this is happening. Be the one that finds the number one psychiatrist that says why people take selfies in dangerous situations. Talk to the airline, talk to, you know, there's so many different avenues to write a really unique, cool article that isn't necessarily what everyone else is writing. For, so for me, this is a tool. I never sleep. I really don't, I don't know if you can tell. But I never sleep, so I am always on Twitter, always on social media.